We, we feel safe here, and so I hope you feel safe too. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Timothy Wilson. Tim Wilson is an honorary curator in the Department of Western Art of the Ashmolean Museum, where he was uh, formerly the keeper, and he retired in 2017. I've known him a long time, but I still felt obliged to look at his website to get some background. And I was interested that he chose to share a selected list of his publications. A selected list. I counted them. There's 121 items, which seemed like me, a rather large list, but there we were. We first met when Tim was assistant keeper of Renaissance collections in the Department of Medieval and Later Antiquities at the British Museum. He was working on an exhibition and publication. It was the ceramic art of the Italian Renaissance. And the City Museum Stoke-on-Trent was lucky enough to be the only venue in England that received the exhibition after it closed at the British Museum. Tim went on to be the keeper of Western art at the Ashmolean Museum. And his world-renowned expertise in Italian Maiolica meant that he's a multitude of honorary associations with major museums in Europe and in America. Uh, those that hold Renaissance collections. And as I read a list of the honorary positions, I was most fascinated by the fact that in 2017, he became a liveryman of the worshipful company of fishmongers of London. I'm not sure what that's about. Extremely fishy. Currently, Tim is president of the Oxford Ceramic Group, with whom the NCS has had a number of su successful collaborations. So I'm really pleased to welcome Tim to, gay, to give the annual Geoffrey Godden Lecture and tell us about the Raphael of Italian Renaissance Maiolica painting, Nicola D'Albino. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Deb, to be introduced by two people who've made such an amazing contribution to ceramic history in this part of the world is, is quite something. I always like coming to the Northern Ceramic Society, um, which I always find inspiring and welcoming. Uh, but since last time when I came, um, I, off the cuff, made an unfavorable comparison with the friendliness of at least one other unnamed ceramic organization and got a certain amount of flack from people who are members of both. Um, I shall not repeat that. Uh, now, if I tap something, will something appear on the screen, do you think? I've got a lovely screen here, but nothing up there. Sorry, I knew there was something else I had to do. <coughs> Hooray, thank you. Um, I didn't know Geoffrey Godden well, great man or meet him often, but he did make a great impression on everybody who met him. In 1987, when, as Pat says, I was working at the British Museum, I remember at one of the early ceramic fairs organized by Brown and Anna Horton, I saw on his sta the stand of this self-styled Chinaman, this very handsome plate of 1862, painted at Minton by Thomas Kirkby. Although Minton was one of Godden's many subjects, and he had written a book about it, and he must have known what a special thing it was, the price of this plate was surprisingly modest. I said we would have it for the British Museum. A few minutes later, my colleagues from the V&A saw it and said they would like it too. I readily recognised it would be most appropriate to the V&A and conceded to them. Rather than try to play off the two national museums against each other, Gordon wrote out an invoice to the British nation and let us sort it out between us. I do hope this splendidly characteristic document is still somewhere in the V&A archives. The Kirkby plate is a sort of Minton Majolica, though they're not technically Majolica glazes. Uh, my subject today is Majolica the painted pottery of the Italian Renaissance, which was such an inspiration to Minton and other firms in the middle of the 19th century. Italian potters had learnt the technique of tin-glazed earthenware from neighbouring Islamic countries by soon after 1200, 
But it wasn't until the 15th century, when the culture we call the Renaissance was fully underway, that a sudden and rapid technical explosion took place with a full range of high temperature colors, greater sophistication of drawing, mastery of pictorial space on the surface of a pot, and some upmarket clients. And this led to the development of historiato, narrative painted pottery, and indeed the story of 16th century Maiolica is essentially a story of painting. And I claim my subject today, Nicola da Urbino, as the greatest master of this Renaissance art form. Uh, but to go back a moment or two, the first great monumental service in the story of Historiato was not for Italian patrons at all. North of the Alps, Matthias Corvinus, the humanist king of Hungary, had married Beatrice of Aragon, daughter of the king of Naples, and together they created a sparkling Renaissance court in Budapest. About 1487, potters from the booming ceramic centre of Pesaro made for the Hungarian monarchs a service as sophisticated and elaborate as any Maiolica made up to that date. There are four surviving pieces of this service, which may have been a present to the Queen of Hungary from her cousin Camilla, regent of Pesaro. Um, you'll find that gifts between women uh, are a recurrent theme uh, in the story. Um, and the plates have the arms of Matthias and Beatrice, and the two shields at the top, under a royal crown. And this is the earliest Maiolica service we know of, made for such exalted clients, and a wonderful um, compendium of ornamental motifs of the time it is. Um, on the left, you have a favourite, um, I probably I should continue to turn towards the mic rather than to try and talk to the screen. Um, on the left, uh, you have um, a story from the medieval bestiaries. The unicorns were, according in the medieval mind, famously fierce creatures, but could be subdued uh, by uh, the attentions of a pure virgin. Um, and this was a favourite subject in medieval tapestries and other works of art. Um, and here is a unicorn with his head in the virgin's lap. On the right, um, a subject I think entirely without um, allegorical or mythological meaning, just a lot of happy boys scrumping apples. In 1498, a few years later, around 1498, and perhaps from the same Pesero workshop, was made this plate, um, which uh, we were able to buy for the Ashmolean um, a few years ago. Um, because happily, um, the market had repeatedly determined that it was a fake, um, and so I was able to show that it wasn't, um, and uh, with the help of the art fund, was able to buy it at what was frankly a ridiculously low price. Um, and interestingly, um, one of the very first examples of uh, motifs derived from Chinese porcelain painted on the back. Um, inside the border, is, is very frolicsome with, uh, in the manner of um, engravings of engravers like Nicoletta da Modena, um, the engravings, engravers who were picking up motifs from classical art at the time, but here with a degree of animation that you don't, you don't usually see in the engravings. And in the middle is a scene from Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, a book we'll hear a good deal about. And this is the story of Saix and Alcyone. Uh, Saix was a king, and Alcyone was his wife. Um, and he uh, was going to set off on a sea journey, and Alcyone had a dream that he would come to harm uh, if he did. Um, and there on the left is Saix uh, saying goodbye to Alcyone. Um, in the middle there, he is rowing off to his ship um, on the right. She is tearing her hair in distress because of the ship sails off to the sea in the right-hand distance. Um, he did indeed get shipwrecked and drowned. This is not quite full historiato in the sense that it has um, a, a, a decorative border around it, but it's well on the way to a plate being essentially 
a pure form of Renaissance painting. And at this time, um, frankly, the Italians um, tended to make narrative pictures out of everything they could lay their hands on, most obviously the walls of their houses, their furniture, their glass, their textiles. It was a fanatically picture-making culture, um, Italy around 1500. Um, here is central Italy, the heartland of Italian Maiolica making. Here is a little curse, yes. There on the east coast is Pesaro. Just inland from that is Urbino, which is the, um, what was to become the capital of the Duke of Ur the Duchy of Urbino. Castel Durante, now called Urbania, the, a specialist pottery town, um, a short walk from Urbino, and over the mountains, over the whoops, lost it. Um, over the mountains, Gubbio, um, in the modern region of, of Umbria, but all part historically of the Duchy of Urbino. So those are four, the four substantial pottery towns of this region. Here is Faenza, of course, a great rival pottery centre. Um, here is Mantua, which we'll hear a bit about later. Um, and just off the map at the top, where the cursor is, um, is Brescia, um, which is another town um, I shall have something to say about. After, oh yes, and uh, on the right top is the amazing palace, but many in the Renaissance considered you know, the finest palace in the world, built by the architect Francesco di Giorgio in the late 15th century for Federico da Montefeltro, the celebrated soldier and Duke of Urbino. Um, and the bottom right, a drawing of Urbino and the Ducal Palace um, with a nice sense of the rather vertiginous hills around Urbino. Um, this is a drawing from um, a book you will all know, the uh, three books of the potter's art by Cipriano Picopasso, who is from Castel Durante, um, and written a book written in about 1557 at the request of a visiting French cardinal who wanted to set up um, a, a Maiolica type industry in France, um, but although it was prepared for publication, um, it was never published um, until the 19th century, um, and the manuscript was um, enterprisingly acquired for the VA um, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, we'll see a little bit more of Pico Passo later. After 1500, <coughs> Pesaro, which together with Faenza was a dominant force in the first phase of Historiato production, was overtaken as the centre of fine Maiolica by Urbino and the neighbouring towns of Castel Durante and Gubbio. All four towns became, as I said, part of the Duchy of Urbino and that was inherited in 1508 by Francesco Maria della Rovere. He was the nephew of Pope Julius II, the patron in the Vatican of Raphael and Michelangelo. Niccolo di Gabriele Sbrage, who signed as Niccolo da Urbino, is first mentioned in known Urbino documents in 1520, already described as magista. Um, not just you know, maestro, but a technical term indicating somebody who was, as it were, fully qualified um, in, in the guild and the, a master of his craft and the owner of his own workshop. And Nicola remained based in his native city, Urbino, until his death. Identification of Nicola's works, one of the, he's one of the very first nameable artists um, in Italian Maiolica, um, it's based on five plates which bear his name or initials, though, as you'll see, two of those are contested. This is a fragment in the Louvre um, showing Apollo with a nice classical lyre um, surrounded by the muses um, and four tall vertical trees in the background, like poplar trees. And on the back is the inscription, El Monte de Parnasso, con le nove muse et Apollo, the Mount of Parnassus with the nine muses and Apollo, 
um, and then a monogram which you can amuse yourselves by deciphering as N I C A O L A, O O L, so Nicola, and then Da Urbino. So Nicola's lovely, balanced humanist handwriting has got sadly smudged, but it is um, <coughs> an unequivocally um, marked object. Um, you'll, the subject is taken from Raphael, an engraving after Raphael's painting called the Parnassus in what are called the Stanze, the Raphael rooms in the Vatican. <coughs> um, and the, for instance, the tall trees um, are straight from the engraving. But the, if you have a look at the oval faces of um, Apollo and for others, um, and the slightly worried air which some of them have, um, you'll begin to see the mint marks of Nicola's style. This is a plate that was for many years, I won't say concealed, but unnoticed on the wall of a church in the small town <coughs> excuse me, of Novellara and is now in the Diocesan Museum of Reggio Emilia. Um, and this shows um, the scene from uh, the Old Testament of the discovery of the cup which Joseph had concealed in the sack of his brother Benjamin, um, which allowed Joseph, who was then a senior official in Egypt, to have his brothers arrested and brought back to Egypt. And the inscription, again in that lovely Nicola humanist handwriting, come li fratelli di Joseph fu giunti ad una osteria, e fu li trovati in un sacco di grano una tazza d'oro. How the brothers of Joseph reached a pub um, and was found in a sack of grain, um, a, a golden cup. Io Nicola pinsit. I, Nicola, <coughs> painted it. Uh, we know from the documents <coughs> that Nicola owned his own workshop. And you always, when you're, you have a name on the back of a piece of maiolica, have to bear in mind the possibility that what we're talking about is the mark of the workshop owner rather than the painter. Um, so this pinsit, I painted it, uh, is an unequivocal indication that Nicola was not only the master of his workshop, uh, but a painter of rare talent himself. <coughs> the subject of this plate, um, which is uninscribed, but which caused, uh, which I have no hesitation in attributing Nicola a few years earlier than the pieces I've just shown you, um, it caused heart searching to its Victorian owner, um, the Ashmolean's benefactor and the Renaissance art scholar C.D. Fortnum, um, as to what the subject was. Uh, he thought it must have something to do with King Midas, who in the story from Ovid was given ass's ears, because the king on the right has got long ears. Um, what we see is a seated king with, as I say, long ears. Uh, in front of him kneels an innocent, naked boy. Uh, behind her, having just dropped a torch, is calumny or slander. Um, the <coughs> um, innocent person, you can tell he's innocent, he hasn't got any clothes on, um, is being accused, unjustly accused by calumny um, and equally naked truth stands forlornly at the back, while Envy stands next to the king um, and blinds his eyes um, with, um, with a towel. And in the centre, a bull, probably um, referencing uh, St Luke, who was the patron saint of painters. Um, so this is nothing at all to do with Midas. The iconography is more interesting and a remarkable instance of the complex web of links between ancient art and the art of the Renaissance. Ultimately, the subject goes back to a lost painting by Apelles, the most famous painter of ancient Greece. Neither the painting nor any version of it survives, but it was described by the ancient Greek writer Lucian. More than a thousand years later, about 1435, the Florentine writer Leon Battista Alberti, in his influential treatise on painting, picked up Lucian's description and recommended the subject to Italian painters who might wish to revive or compete with 
the art of the ancients. Among the artists who took up Arbetti's challenge was Luca Signorelli, who in 1509 painted a calumny of Apelles, following uh, Lucian's description, on a wall of the palace of the ruler of Siena, Pandolfo Petrucci. Signorelli's painting has disappeared, but an 18th century description of it survives, and the detail described matches so exactly the composition of the Maiolica plate with envy and the towel and so on, that the painting uh, must have been the ultimate source of the Maiolica. The link was a man called Girolamo Genga, an Urbino-born collaborator of Signorelli, who in 1522 came to Urbino as court designer and architect to Duke Francesco Maria della Rovere. It seems overwhelmingly likely that the Maiolica painting is based on a drawing supplied to Nicola by Genga. The plate cannot therefore be earlier than 1522, which is a useful dating pointer. It was a subject that both Nicola and Girolamo Genga liked. Here on the left is a magnificent plate in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, um, also, uh, in my opinion, by Nicola, uh, with a different version of the same subject, um, a magnificent, um, elaborate border of masks and grotesques um, and the arms of the Florentine family of Ridolfi. On the right, um, a later work, a fresco by Girolamo Genga himself in the Villa Imperiale, which you see uh, bottom right, um, a palace outside Pesaro, designed for the Duke of Urbino by Genga and frescoed by him and a, um, a group of other distinguished painters brought to Pesaro for the purpose. So, a popular subject. Renaissance Maiolica services, if they survived at all, have almost always been dispersed. The wonderful exception is a set of 17 plates which were acquired together early in the 19th century by the Venetian collector Teodoro Correa and are now in the Correa Museum at Venice. Here are five plates from that set, all with stories of Orpheus, the supreme musician of ancient legend. Top left, Orpheus making music um, and the animals gathering round to listen. I'm sorry, these are my slides taken on a table in Venice and they're not of the best. Um, to the right top, um, Orpheus's beloved wife Eurydice, um, bitten by a snake and killed. I hope you can just see the snake. Um, bottom left, Orpheus, his, his music is so enchanting that it uh, crosses the boundaries between life and death, uh, plays his music, and here is Charon, the ferryman of the river Styx, between the, our world and the underworld, coming over to fetch Orpheus. Um, and Orpheus so charms Hades that he gets permission to take his dead wife back from Hades, uh, the one condition being that he must not look back as he walks back towards our world. Um, Ultimately, he cannot resist turning around and looking back, um, and here is a, a devil gleefully seizing Eurydice, who stretches out his, her arms to him and pulling her back through the portal of Hades. And then at the end, um, Orpheus, um, whether by being gay or in some other way, <coughs> gave offence to a group of uh, Thracian women followers of Bacchus, um, who proceeded to beat him to death, and there he is being killed on the right. Um, why? You should not be homophobic. Um, another plate from the set. Um, here is Apollo, Pan and Midas, another story from Ovid's Metamorphoses. On the left is Pan playing his pipes. Um, on the right, the upper figure on the right is Apollo, this time playing not a classical lyre like we saw before, but a <coughs> Renaissance stringed instrument, a, a bowed instrument, a viola da braccio. Um, and left is Midas, um, who um, judged the competition um, and foolishly judged Pan to have made better music than Apollo, uh, for which he was punished by being given, as we heard before, ass's ears. And there, in this lovely little vignette, in the middle is Apollo sticking ass's ears onto Midas. Now, if you look at the figure of Apollo on the right, um, and then at this fresco, 
um, I think you'll agree that there's more than a passing similarity. This fresco is from a sequence painted by um, the Urbino artist Timoteo Viti um, in the Palazzo Ducale about 1506. Um, and there is clearly a link. I mean, there has been a great deal of debate about whether Viti might have provided drawings to Niccolo, or Viti might have painted the Maiolica himself. And my own hypothesis, especially since um, this shows Viti's work um, in, in a manner that became characteristic of it 15 or 20 years before the date of the Maiolica, um, is that Niccolo, as a young man, was associated with Viti's workshop, um, at possibly as an apprentice uh, before, be in painting, before he decided to go in for Maiolica painting, but that is um, a hypothesis. Here are two more plates from the service. Um, here are uh, the four seasons on the left. <coughs> left is spring, with Venus and Cupid. In the middle, summer. Um, on the right, an extremely tubby and well-fed, uh, rather bacchic autumn, um, and on the right, a thin and haggard winter, all you know, elegantly arranged in, front, in this rocky landscape. And on the right, another subject from Ovid. Um, this is not the story of Narcissus and Echo. Here, Narcissus, uh, you will remember, uh, was beloved by the nymph Echo, uh, but was so self-obsessed um, that he would do nothing other than look at his own reflection in a stream um, and admire it. And here he is. Uh, falling in love with his own reflection. You can just see a shadow of the ref his reflection in the water um, at, at the bottom with his falcon on his arm. Um, left is uh, e the nymph Echo, um, despairing of his love and transformed, pining away and being transformed into a rock. And in the centre, um, a different nymph finds the dead figure of Narcissus, who again has died essentially from self-love. Um, in another a lovely pastoral Arcadian Nicola landscape. Um, <coughs> and here is um, <coughs> the subject of Apo another of its subject Apollo and Marcias, uh, another music competition. That Apo Marcias was a satyr um, who sort of half man um, who challenged Apollo to another music competition. Um, and the condition was that uh, the winner could do what he liked with the loser. Um, and Apollo won um, and chose to exact as his victory prize the flaying alive of the miserable Marcias. And there in this little vignette in the middle is Marcias being flayed alive. Um, and on the left, in a temple very much in the manner of the Renaissance architect Donato Bramante, um, is you can just see Marcias's skin hung up in the temple of Apollo. Uh, but my main purpose in showing you this is to point up the, the bianco sopra bianco, the white on white decoration, which Nicola uses to separate the uh, sort of donut form of the rim, um, which he always unifies into a single landscape composition from the little central vignettes. Um, bianco sopra bianco, um, which I think probably has its origin in designs in lace. It doesn't really seem to have um, any good precedence, as far as I know, in either Chinese or Islamic ceramics, um, begins in these years, um, around 1520 and a little bit before. Um, and its long story, of course, you know, goes through um, to English 18th century Delftware. Um, <clears throat> the <coughs> story of Apollo and Marcias um, is taken from a key book in the history of Renaissance art. This is an illustrated Italian language prose edition of Ovid's Metamorphoses, published in Venice in 1497, um, with these very, very handy woodcuts. Um, and the thing about these woodcuts is that they have a sequence of stories, um, slightly sort of strip cartoony, um, but arranged in a single <coughs> composition. So there are Apollo and Marcias. Um, there's Apollo flaying Marcias, and there's Marcias's skin hung up in the temple. And there are two extraneous scenes on the left, um, which Niccolo, in the form of creating a unified dramatic composition, has eliminated while arranging the rest um, in what seems very sort of natural and easy, but if you consider just how difficult it is to arrange narrative scenes on effectively a donut, 
um, I think you uh, will get a sense of what the extraordinary you know, narrative compositional skill, um, as well as, for me, lyrical charm of these things. Last piece um, from the Korea service. Um, this is an exception in that this is a subject from the Old Testament. This is Solomon um, adoring an idol. Um, it says Salomone on the, um, at the plinth just to the left of the kneeling figure. Um, and this is derived from a different Renaissance book called the Hypnoratomachia Polyphily, a kind of fantastic dream narrative published with woodcuts um, in 1499 in Venice. And so you can see that these, these small, modest woodcuts are um, available relatively cheaply, um, are you know, becoming a great resource for Maiolica painters in the development of the earliest historiato in the Urbino region. Um, I think you probably can't see in the slide, but at the bottom of the left-hand column below the word Salomone, um, there are the figures 1482. Um, this caused tremendous difficulties to Victorian scholars because for all the world it looked like a date, 1482. Um, the answer is that it can't possibly be. There's you know, ev every, you know, a mass of evidence that these things were made in the early 1520s. Um, so, and I have no idea, frankly, what that 1482 means and should be glad of any suggestions. I don't think any of the many people who've written about the Korea Museum Service who ever come up with a theory with the remotest shred of plausibility. <clears throat> uh, the subject of, in the Hypnotomachia incident, is some parents consulting the Oracle of Apollo. Again, Apollo marked out by his, his, his Apollo's emblems are a bow um, and a lyre or a lute. Um, so Nicola has changed the subject as well as setting the figures in front of this elegant, classicising architectural background. Um, please notice the architecture of this plate and keep it in your mind for a moment, and also keep in mind the, um, the detail of the plinth um, on which Apollo stands, of course, for which there's no useful suggestion in the original woodcut. This bowl is in the Hermitage in St Petersburg. On the back, in a, on a fictive piece of paper, is a further monogram of Niccolo, this time without the A, the date 1521, um, and some, uh, what in Italian is called alla porcellana, decoration loosely in the manner of imported Chinese porcelain. Um, and this shows a crowned king with biblical inscriptions on the columns, again these slightly um, swelling columns that we've really seen as characteristic of Nicola. Um, and the source of the figure, though of nothing else, is a, um, an engraving by Marc Antonio Raimondi, who was an artist who made a business out of making and selling engravings on designs by Raphael and close members of Raphael's workshop. Um, but though you can see this, the, the figure is taken from the engraving, but the setting, the landscape background, and the architectural figures are completely Nicola's, as is the little swallow. Whoops, lost it. The little uh, bird here, um, identified as a swallow, um, which probably has some emblematic meaning rather than just being there for fun. Um, it has been suggested that this is a representation in some way of Francesco Maria della Rovere, the Duke of Urbino, uh, but that's contentious and probably for another lecture. The Hermitage Bowl has long been attributed to Niccolo and regarded as his first marked and dated work, and I'd never doubted this myself. However, a few years ago, my mentor John Mallet, known to many of you, wrote about this bowl as follows. An exhibition at Faenza recently gave me opportunity to examine the Hermitage Bowl in the original, and I was astonished to find in its figure painting none of the suppleness of line that study of Nicola's work, including early work like the calumny at Oxford or the Correa service at Venice, had led me to expect. The quality of the painting wasn't in doubt, but I was left wondering whether the Hermitage Bowl really could be by Nicola, um, and in later writing, um, John has suggested that the painting is partly 
um, by another great figure in Urbina Maiolica painting, uh, Francesco Xantovelli. Um, my instinct has always been to stick with the attribution to Nicola and put the slight hardness of drawing of the figure down to the fact that the painter was copied in grain. Uh, over 40 years of studying Maiolica, however, um, I've learned that when I disagree with John Mallet, uh, it's usually me who is wrong. Um, but uh, you can make up your own minds about it. John and I agree to differ on this as on a good deal else and remain the best of friends. Here is Francesco Maria della Rovere and his wife Eleonora Gonzaga, uh, Duke and Duchess of Urbino, um, both painted by Titian a bit later. Eleonora was the daughter of Francesco Marquis of Mantua. I pointed Mantua on the map to you uh, when we had the map. Um, and Francesco's wife, who was Isabella d'Este, passionate art patron and collector, often known uh, then as well as now as the First Lady of the Renaissance. In 1524, Duchess Eleonora, imagine her a bit younger than in this picture, wrote to her mum, who was in Mantua, Thinking of visiting Your Excellency, I recommend all of you with children to encourage your children to call you Your Excellency. Uh, thinking of visiting Your Excellency and bringing some product of these lands, which might give you pleasure, but not finding anything that seemed to me suitable at this season, I had made a service, and the word she uses is credenza, of earthenware pottery, since the masters of this land of ours have some reputation for good work. I shall be pleased if Your Excellency likes it, and if you will make use of it at Porto, since it is a villa thing. It's a cosa da villa, a villa thing. Here is Isabella, drawn by Leonardo. Um, she spent much of her life trying to get Leonardo to do a painting for her collection, uh, but never succeeded. Um, and underneath are three plates from the service that was sent by Eleonora to her mum in November 1524. On the left, Apollo uh, pursuing the nymph Daphne in the British Museum. In the centre, the wraith between Hippomenes and Atalanta, um, <clears throat> uh, also from Ovid, um, with the arms of Isabella and uh, Francesco Maria, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Francesco Gonzaga and his wife Isabella's arms, as the heralds say, impaled, that's to say his arms, um, in what is the left-hand side of the shield as you look at it, and her family arms in the right-hand side. Um, and on the right um, are Perseus and Andromeda, um, in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. We'll come back to the Apollo and Daphne in a moment. Porto, mentioned by Eleonora as a possible home for the service, was Porto Mantovano, Isabella d'Este's country villa, now vanished outside Mantua. The phrase cosa da villa is an eloquent one. When on duty, on formal occasions in Mantua, Court decorum would have required Isabella, the wife of the head of state, to eat of silver or even gold. But off duty, in the relaxed world of her country villa and its gardens, where she sought out the company of other women and men of letters and enjoyed music, Maiolica with classical subject matter was appropriate and provided the starting point for literary conversation. We do in fact have tangible evidence that Porto Mantovano was seen as a specifically female space. In Isabella's will, made in 1535, she left everything to her son Federico, except for the villa at Porto, which, unusually, she specifically left to her daughter-in-law and to the future duchesses of Mantua for their pleasure and entertainment. So that's the kind of atmosphere in which you have to imagine this Maiolica. And these are three of 24 pieces of the service, which are the glory of uh, museums and a few private collections around the world. The other key word in Eleonora's letter is credenza. The Italian word has two meanings, either a service of precious metal or ceramic, or a piece of furniture on which such things can be displayed, a sort of Renaissance Welsh dresser. Although Eleonora stated that she expected the Maiolica to be used, and even the finest pottery was never too good to use in affluent households, I think we may reasonably imagine a service like Isabella's displayed on a credenza when not in use. Sadly, we have no certain contemporary images of fine pottery displayed like this on a credenza, 
But here is a drawing a few years later of a courtly party um, with what is probably pe precious metal displayed on a credenza at the end, but it might just possibly be ceramics, if not, use your imagination. Here is the British Museum plate again, um, and next to it I've put back the um, fragment in the Louvre. And if you, for instance, compare uh, the figure of the Apollo here on the left, standing over the monster Python that he killed. Python was a very fierce monster. One of Nicola's characteristics is that he has very charming, tame dragons, which you might well keep as a, as, as a household pet. <coughs> um, and, but if you compare the face of the Apollo there with the face of the Apollo there, um, I hope um, you may be convinced without too much difficulty that um, they are both by the same painter. And indeed, um, Isabella's service was, of course, the you know, most fantastically prestigious commission any Mallorca painter in Urbino could hope to have. Um, and it was, I think, um, entirely painted by Nicola himself without any intervention from assistants. Um, on your right is a page from the 1497 Ovid. Um, with Apollo and Daphne, the successive scenes. Um, left, Apollo has killed Python. Uh, you can see that Nicola's dragon is, 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 is much less threatening. Uh, here is Apollo um, chasing the nymph Daphne, who he fancies, um, and she prays to her father, the river god Peneus, not in the woodcut, but added in the Maiolica plate um, in a figure derived from classical river sculpture, I mean, at the top, the beginning of the whole story, um, which is Apollo telling off the boy Cupid for having a bow and arrow on the grounds that these were uh, not children's weapons but and should be reserved for grown-ups. Um, Cupid is very, very pissed off by this um, and shoots an arrow at Apollo, who accordingly falls in love with Daphne, whereupon the whole scene ensues. Again, in the arms of Isabella um, Gonzaga impaling Este, um, in the centre, um, and this effortless narrative composition um, of successive scenes in a single landscape um, on the border. Oh. Okay, something funny has happened here there, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine here. Um, Pickle Pasto, um, I've already mentioned, and you all know the uh, extraordinary but manuscript, the three books of the Potter's Art of about 1557, and you probably also know this um, celebrated drawing by Pickle Passer of Maiolica painters at work um, in their studio with a very, very handy little turntable um, with the, in which they can whiz, whiz the colours around like port at an Oxford high table, um, and on the wall are a variety of prints and drawings stuck up. Um, you can easily imagine them as pages taken out of um, an one of the Ovid editions for the Mallorca painters to use as inspiration. And here's another plate of different kind of composition <coughs> um, from Isabella's service. Um, this is a medieval story about the Emperor Trajan, um, known to art historians as the Justice of Trajan. And this is a story told, in fact, not in, in ancient literature, but by Pope Gregory the, the Great, um, of how the Emperor Trajan um, stopped an entire army on its way to war in order to see justice done to a poor widow whose child had been killed. Um, but I show it to you um, really for the joy of this wonderful imaginative representation of Rome on the background. Um, and Nicola, Nicola's delight in architecture and his knowledge of up-to-date developments in architecture as practiced by architects like Bramante um, is very striking um, and pretty well unique among Maiolica painters. Um, one of the big plates of Isabella's service, um, again the arms in the centre, this is the abduction of Helen, um, the, when Paris son of the King of Troy, abducted Helen, the wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. Um, and um, you'll remember that Helen had been, had been promised to Paris by Venus as a reward 
for a beauty competition between uh, the goddesses. And here she is <coughs> um, being uh, reluctantly pulled into a boat. Um, and here is, uh, this is an engraving by Marco de Ravenna, an associate of Marco Antonio Raimondi's, after a design by Raphael. And here is, um, again, Nicola's effortless translation of this into the donut form of a rim. Um, it's technically extraordinarily adept. Uh, you may feel, I think I do, that as he starts using these elaborate, sophisticated engravings after designs by Raphael um, and following them more closely, um, his imagination has slightly less rain. Um, and we're just beginning to lose <coughs> a little of the, the lyrical, the pastoral, the Arcadian quality um, of landscapes which make uh, some of the slightly earlier work so lovable. Most of Nicola's service for Isabella is made up of stories from Ovid. Um, this is an exception. This is a somewhat obscure subject from the Old Testament. <coughs> this is Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, um, who were posing as brother and sister. But here they are being spied upon by King Abimelech, um, who ascertains from uh, what we might call their body language that they are, in fact, husband and wife, not brother and sister. Um, and consequences ensue. Um, this is taken not from an engraving, but from um, a work by Raphael and his studio shortly before Raphael died in 1520 in the Vatican Lodges. Um, <coughs> um, and this is, here is the, um, the fresco, uh, which hadn't, as it happened, been engraved by 1524 when Nicola painted the set. Um, and John Mallet, um, many years ago now, pointed out that even if it had been engraved, there is no way Nicola could have known that the sky was this rather, the sun was this rather surreal blue. Um, and so that he must either have been to the Vatican or more likely had access to a coloured drawing. Um, since John made that observation, um, it has emerged that Giulio Romano, who had been running Raphael's workshop after Raphael's death in 1520, Raphael's workshop in Rome, um, in the service mainly of the popes, <coughs> um, had travelled up towards Mantua, where he took service with Isabella and her son Federico, um, and had stopped in Urbino. So this is slightly the what if, or let us, he must often have walked this road sort of history, but it seems to me overwhelmingly likely that Giulio stopped, called in on the Duchess and said, anything I can do for your ma'am, I'm just going up to take service with your mother. Um, and that Eleonora had said, oh, my Maiolica painter is just finishing off this Maiolica service that we're going to send up um, to, to Mantua. Uh, would you kindly um, provide him a couple of nice, nice fashionable drawings? And that Giulio provided um, Nicola with the drawing for this set, which is um, this subject, which explains not only um, the composition and the blue sun, uh, but also what a, a biblical subject is doing among the generally Ovidian themes of the service. Um, just a little bit later, there is the next of Nicola's uh, um, armorial services. Um, and this has the arms of a man called Valente Valenti Gonzaga um, and his wife, who is called Violante Gambara. And those of you who are um, aficionados of Italian restaurants may have had gambari, um, which are effectively crayfish. Um, and here you can see that Gambara is the wife's name, and that crayfish is a, is, 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 is a punning um, family arms on her family name. Um, and th they were friends of Isabella's, and in 1525, uh, Violante had a baby. Um, it seems to me overwhelmingly likely um, that Isabella, pleased with her service, um, commissioned from the same Maiolica painter a service for her friend. Um, and what is charming about this is the appropriateness of this subject, um, which are um, Adam and Eve after the fall, but enjoying some relatively happy family life. Um, from another um, fresco in the, in the lodges, again, probably via a, a drawing by Giulio Romano. Um, and um, 
a very nice, with these two little children who are Cain and Abel, um, a very nice subject um, for a childbirth present. Um, even more charming um, for me is the fact that in the fresco, Cain and Abel, two children, um, have a sheep, have a pet sheep. Um, and Abel, of course, um, you know, sacrifices a sheep later in the fatal incident in which he gets killed. Uh, but Nicola has decided to change that into an excessively well-behaved, collared family dog. Um, another, the, the, the third of the armorial services of this period was made for um, the Callini family of Brescia, and those are the Callini family arms. Um, here are two plates from it. On the left is another story from Ovid. Um, this is um, Achilles, Achilles, sorry, yes, Achilles here, uh, being killed um, by Paris, um, having been enticed into a temple of Apollo on the pretext of a romantic assignation with one of the daughters of the king of Troy, um, which gave um, Paris the chance to kill him. Um, Achilles, you'll all remember, was invulnerable, um, except in his heel, which had not been dipped in the river Styx, and here he is being shot in um, the, the heel and top left are the gods plotting Achilles' downfall. Um, again, um, a handsome architectural interior of a very Nicola type. On the right, something much more unusual um, because this is a muse crowning a young man and on the right, an astrologer casting a horoscope. Um, and not just any old horoscope because on that pyramid underneath him, are a series of numbers. So this is a specific horoscope. Um, and that this very year, um, Luigi Callini and his wife <coughs> um, had their first child. Um, and they were from Brescia. And Brescia is where Violante Gambara came from. So this is a series of connected commissions which go from Urbino to Mantua to Brescia through, I think, a network of female friendships. Um, and, th and she had a child in 1525, um, and um, it seems to be very likely that if we knew the date of birth of that child, it might miraculously become possible to interpret the horoscope. These are two large plates, one in the British Museum, one in the Getty, from um, the Kalini set. Um, two stories we've seen before. Here's um, Apollo and Pan. Um, and So here's Apollo and Pan right, and Apollo and Marcias left, with Marcias being flayed. Um, the interesting thing about these, uh, the reason I show them to you, um, is that they are both uh, loosely derived on, from woodcuts in the Ovid but they've been transformed, again, in Nicola's characteristic way, but transformed in a way that is symmetrical. That's to say there's a Bramantesque kind of temple on the right matching a Bramantesque temple um, on the left. There is a curly tree um, at one end and there are curly trees um, at the other. There are clouds on the inside there and the clouds on the inside there. I think that these two plates, which are the two large plates of the service, were conceived to be shown as a visual pair. And that's one of the bits of evidence we have, that such things were imagined by their painters for display on a credenza and not just for use on a table. <laughs> uh, one more plate from the Kalini service. Um, this is Europa and the Bull. Um, Europa, uh, the um, Zeus, Jupiter, um, pretending to just posing as a bull um, in order to uh, seduce Europa and here he is sailing away off to have his way with her. Um, this is for, obviously from the Kalini set and uh, was sold in London in 1938 um, and disappeared and no Maiolica specialist um, I think saw it for more than 50 years until uh, Howard Coots and Celia Kerno uh, came across it on loan to the Graves Art Gallery in Sheffield, um, entirely sort of unknown to, to, to the Maiolica world, um, and it is now um, on the market. I'm sorry that the owner did not think fit 
to try and find a way for it to be acquired by the, the Graves Art Gallery, but that's the way of the world. Um, and very recently, um, on the market, um, and um, acquired by uh, somebody in this room, is this tiny fragment, which I very much coveted, but even a tiny fragment by Nicola um, is beyond my means. Um, and I think you know, the cows, like the faces, are fairly characteristically recognisable Nicola. Um, and this is, I think, a fragment from, the, you can just see the Bianco Sopra Bianco um, at the top edge um, of the rim. Um, and I think this is probably a fragment from um, another Europa and the Bull by Nicola, possibly even one for Isabella's service. Um, this is, um, I won't linger long about this, um, this is a characteristic plate by Nicola, um, which we acquired for the Ashmolean a few years ago. The subject is problematic, uh, but I think that what this probably is, is bad news coming in from the right. And this is the nymph companions of Proserpina, hearing that she's been whisked off to the underworld by Hades, in which case there would have been a companion plate um, of a subject is well known on Myolica, of Hades, um, um, Pluto, taking Proserpina off with him to the underworld. Um, this is a plate in the Bargello with the martyrdom of St. Cecilia um, in a cauldron after another engraving, after another design by Raphael. Um, and in, again, in Nicola's wonderful um, handwriting, the Historia di Santa Cecilia, la quale è fatta in bottega di Guido da Castel Dorante in Urbino, 1528, with Nicola's monogram evidently painted by Nicola, um, but the inscription in this lovely hand, lovely flourishing handwriting tells us that this was painted by Nicola not in his own workshop, but in the workshop of a, the other leading um, Urbino Maiolica paint workshop of the time run by Guido Durantino. Um, why Urbino, who had, um, Nicola, who had his own workshop, should have chosen to paint such an ambitious work in the workshop of um, a colleague or perhaps rival, um, we don't know. It would be fun to speculate on that. I think Nicola would have been a delight to know. Um, here are two wine bottles, two, two and two. Um, on the left, um, one with two subjects of a, an enjoyably drunken and um, out of it Bacchus on the right. And these are wine bottles, of course, um, some frolics and putty uh, gathering grapes and trampling them in an enormous tub. Um, not No engraved source, no meaning, just a joyous subject for a wine bottle. Um, and here we've already seen this subject, not the same plate. Um, this is another version of the abduction of Helen, and here is its engraved source again. I show it to you to point out, and I hope you can see on the screen, that here round at the bottom, on these three rocks at the bottom, there is something which, for the moment, I'll call a stoat and a weasel. These, I'm sure, have absolutely no emblematic um, significance at all. But there's a bit of empty space, um, and I think that Nicola has put them in just for fun, just for the joy of it. Um, the fifth of the marked place is the most contentious. This is one in the British Museum, how the Athenians sacrificed to the goddess Diana, Nicola da U. Um, this has always been regarded as a key work in the reconstruction of Nicola's work. Um, I think we'll agree that there's been some falling off of quality between the plates I've shown you hitherto and this. Indeed, John Mallet has described it of miserable quality and argued the defects of drawing and design are uncharacteristic of Nicola, and he thinks the painting is by a workshop assistant. However, there is much of Nicola about it, the handwriting on the back, the curly trees, which you'll see are very characteristic of Nicola, the sculpted plinth, which we saw in the um, Solomon subject of the Correa set, um, and the words on the back are in the form usually used for painter's signatures without any wording such as in the workshop of. I prefer to think of this as Nicola on an off day or when he was not well or after one too many glasses of the excellent local wine, but perhaps with an apprentice lending a clumsy hand. Um, it's quite an interesting general art historical problem of how 
you know, a great artist can have off days and how much if something is really substandard, you have to assume the intervention of assistants. <coughs> Isabella's son was Federico, Duke of Mantua, here again, excellent dog, um, and his wife was Margarita Paleologo. And around 1533, uh, Nicola painted a service, um, painted some pla plates of an historiato service with mainly classical subjects and the arms and devices of the couple. Here is the complicated arms of a husband and wife. Here are the arms of Margarita's family alone. Um, and here is the device, the impresa. Um, I, I didn't talk about the, the, the uh, devices, the personal emblems of Isabella, which decorate the Isabella service, but I can talk about them if anyone <coughs> has any questions about them. But Renaissance aristocrats tended to adopt learning or punning or mysterious emblems called imprese, and the Mount, this one of Mount Olympus was Federico's. Now, to my eye, the one on the left in particular is not particularly superior to this. John's view is that this is not good enough to be Nicola, but that these three are all by Nicola. Again, subjective art historical judgments, uh, and John and I will cheerfully agree to differ. Nicola died in the winter of 1537 to 38, but in the 1520s, he'd almost single-handedly created what was to become the narrative style of Urbino Historiato for decades, what generations of collectors have called Raphael were. When in 1987, I gave him the title, I think for the first time, though that may not be right, the Raphael of Maiolica painting, I was thinking not only of Nicola's preeminence among Maiolica painters, but of the way his style moves from an almost gauche for poetic lyricism in works like the Correa set to something more weighty and monumental um, in the larger plates that take their inspiration from their, their models from Raphael in school engravings. And this is a development that parallels a few years behind Raphael's own artistic career. I'm fairly confident that the Correa set and the works linked to it are correctly attributed to Nicola, but I have to admit that the stylistic change between them and, say, the Bargello plate of 1528 is rapid, almost vertiginous, for a period of just six years. And this has given rise to reasonable arguments about the attribution of a few of the pieces I've shown you. If I'm right about the attributions, this is a stylistic change. It's hard to imagine, except in a young artist. And we don't know when Nicola was born, but I think it likely he was still in his 20s or just about 30 when he painted the Correa and Isabella services. Um, and if so, he would have been barely 40 when he died. So you, I think you can reckon him not only as the Raphael, but as the Mozart of my Olica painting. It's one of the pleasures of studying my Olica that unexpected new things turn up. Only this month, this lovely plate with Samson and Delilah, uh, which I hope you will immediately recognize as stylistically very close to the Correa set, and possibly indeed once part of the same set, was sold at Lyon and Turnbull Auction House in Edinburgh for 1.3 million pounds. Um, and despite the fact that it's not in absolutely perfect condition, having been found by Celia Curno in a Scottish country house. It's now the centrepiece of a marvellous private collection in London. This may be, uh, other people may know better, a world record for a piece of European pottery. Anyway, if any pottery painter deserves the esteem implied by such a price, I hope to have made the case that it's that most joyful of my Olica artists, Nicola da Urbino. Thank you. Are you okay to take some questions? I, if I can answer them. Okay. The Germans have an excellent word which is überfragt, which means I've over asked. <laughs> so we shall see. So, do we have any questions? Oh, right away. Just a second, I think a microphone will arrive and then we can all hear the question. Um, I did find the presentation completely captivating. 
The only thing that was um, missing for me as not being terribly aware of this material was scale. You talked of large plates. You showed these amazing photographs, but there was no indication. Okay. Is it a saucer? Is it a so, plate? No. Well, I did. I did say. You know, this is. Um, of course, there are you know, a whole lot of technical developments in the 16th century. There is. The, the increase in the number of forms that complicated dinner services have. But the art history of this subject is very much one about painting and lecture images are you know, unfortunately flat. Um, this is what the Italians call a coppa, um, a shallow um, uh, dish, um, and not much more than half an inch, three quarters of an inch deep um, on a low foot. Um, and is about 10 inches across. These are all uh, plates with very small foot rings, um, about 9 to 10 inches across. Um, that's 9 inches, that's about 17 or 18 inches. That, that, these are the largest plates of the service. Interestingly, a document at about the time of Federico's service of 1533, when somebody is commissioned to go and and order a set of Maiolica. He says, those big plates are not in fashion anymore. So in 1525, a service would in typically include some great big plates up to 18 or even 20 inches across. Uh, but by 1530, those had fallen out of fashion. Uh, the pilgrim flasks are about 11 inches high. Uh, this is another big plate, 14, 15 inches. Uh, this is 10 inches, 12. 15, 10, 10, 9, <laughs> Eight, seven, six. 15, and, uh, um, that's, that's, sorry. and if you want that in centimetres, I'm sorry, you'll have to do it yourself. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we may be friendly, but we're also old-fashioned. I think we're still mostly inches here. I, I had a couple of questions as you went along, one of which you answered. So that was, uh, I was interested in whether they were used or displayed. Um, and you talked about the credenza and the display and them being used and displayed. Were they just plates in a service or were there hollowware pieces as well? Uh, the, there's no indication that the Correa set had anything other than plates. The Isabella service, there is one jug um, and there are, I think, likely to have been candlesticks. Um, and, some, some, and later on, a typical service will have big plates, little plates, um, candlesticks, ewers, jugs, um, pilgrim flasks. See, I can understand jugs and candlesticks because you don't actually physically put things on the surface. It's inside or <coughs> candles. But it seems amazing that you would subject plates like that to surface interference. Well, Isabella's surface, though some of them are broken, very few of them show any wear, so that was clearly not actually used very much. But Eleonora is quite unequivocal. You'll use this at Porto. But I think what you're talking about is having your grapes and cheese from you. You're not talking about having your meat. Oh, right. You're not talking about having your meat so in two places. You're not, you're not taking your cutlery to it. No. no. <laughs> and then the other question, I was wondering whether we know what the status of someone like Nicola might, Nicola might be in, in society. Was he just a craftsman, one of many, or was he esteemed, or...? Um, Guido Durantino, who I mentioned, the sort of rival Mallorca Roger, did become uh, priore, that's to say, you know, master mm -hmm. of, of, of an Urbino company, so gets to you know, middle social rank. Um, Nicole, um, what you don't get, intriguingly, in any of the commissioning documents we have, you, we don't get what you, in a painting commission, if you're commissioning a painting from Giulio Romano, your contract will almost always say, and at least the figures are to be entirely painted by the master's hands and not by assistants. You never get that. So there is not, not an enormous added value um, to you know, this very, very high artistic level, which I've been arguing um, Nicola achieves. And just to put them in um, money perspective, um, Federico, um, Gonzaga, the Duke of Urbino, commissions from Giulio, Urbino, Giulio Romano when he's his court designer 
in about 1531, I think, um, a silver salt. Um, and that is 30 ducats, I think 30 ducats for the materials, 